and we've got to really move. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ada Jones. Uh, at least all of us seem to think of him as that. Milford Fargo, who'll say a little bit about Ada. Uh, notice the sneaky part of our program here. This gives us a chance to change our tape while Milfred is talking. So, Milfred, we'll give you the floor and let you go to town. The story of my life is to fill in. <laughs> I had the honor of knowing Walter Van Brunt, who you know also recorded under the name of Walter Scanlon. From the tapes we made together, I have uh, transcribed two stories in his own words. The first is about his recording with Ada Jones, who is a particular interest of mine, as many of you know. And that was not she on that blue amber roll, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Walder said, this is about his recording with Ada, my voice evidently cut a little more than Ada's. And I would stand back of her shoulder. I'd put my arm around her lots of times. Especially where I was singing harmony, I'd have to get back a little so I wouldn't drown her voice out. When Ada would sing solo, she'd stand in. And when I had a solo part, Ada would move over. On the interludes between verses, we'd both duck down to let the sound of the orchestra past us. Then we'd have to come up. We'd duck down on the introductions and the tags. There was the darndest lot of this business. If you had a headache, it wasn't so good. <laughs> when we were both singing, then I'd put my arm around her and we'd almost have our heads together, pointing right straight into the horn. It was just a little small opening and it was made out of a material that wouldn't vibrate. She would stand on a box. She was shorter. I was always five foot ten. Most companies had a music rack to put your stuff on. Others, you'd uh, pin it down. You didn't hold it because it would rattle. And I have a picture, just happened to have a picture, of Ada Jones standing on a box. Um, and this, of course, is not Walter Van Brunt, but it's old Cal Stewart. And they were making one of the Uncle Josh stories. You can also see from Walter's description that the recording horn wasn't very big at this point. Ernie Stevens is going to tell us about the big one. Um, but I'll pass this around. Leah Burt has also put one on display in, in the case out in the foyer, so if you want to get a closer look. This is from a magazine called Farm and Fireside of January 1921. This was shortly, this picture was taken shortly before Cal Stewart's death. We'll start with Miss White here, all right? The uh, other story, one of the other stories that Walter told me concerns a record he always wanted to make and also a joke that he and pianist Albert Benzler pulled on Mr. Edison. He tells us, it's, well, it's one, one of the many take me home again Kathleen stories. Um, <laughs> but it happened at one of Mr. Edison's birthday parties. You know, Walter Van Brunt never wanted to make that record in the first place, but Mr. Edison insisted it was a good song and it would be good for Walter, and of course he was right. <clears throat> you sang a song for the guests, then you sang it again in Mr. Edison's ear. He would never wear a hearing aid. He said there were too many things he didn't want to hear. <laughs> Albert Benzler was a good clown. We had a few drinks together, and we were feeling pretty good. Somebody came down to the table and said, Walter, the old man wants you to sing Kathleen. I wanted to do the little gray home in the West. I loved it, thought it was a great song. He couldn't see it. No good. Wouldn't let me make it. Several times I approached him about it through Walter Miller. He wouldn't give in. He didn't like the song. It was no good. Well, I had this all cooked up, and I sang Kathleen for his audience, and then Bensler went into the key for the little gray home in the West. 
I sang it right in his ear. <laughs> and I'll never forget the old man leaning over like this. And, and when he heard this tune, his head went up this way. And I know he called me a son of a bee. <laughs> 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 but, but then he put out his hand and I took it and he shook it and then he went back and let me finish it well they applauded and so I said that's it I'm fired that's the end of that the old man will give me my walking papers in the morning well do you know the following day Walter Miller called up and said listen the old man thought that was one of the greatest things he said, the kid had nerve enough to do it. Go ahead, let him make the little gray home in the West, which I did. I'll be honest with you, if it hadn't been for those couple of drinks, I never would have had nerve enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was a great joke. And you know, the old man had a great sense of humor. And I found that Walter Van Brunt did too. As you know, he died at Easter time in 1971 in Ohio, where he was living with one of his daughters. Uh, we miss him very much, but we rejoice in the many, many records that he left us. And I feel highly privileged to have known him personally and to be able to share some of his memories with you tonight. Thank you. Well, we have to go on with our dog trot again. Uh, the next recording shows another facet of Edison recording. We don't know how this was made. Possibly Theodore Edison can tell us something about it later. This is the Edison, so-called Edison Day recording, which I've been on the trail of for many years. Uh, we finally located in the vault. We find that the site has four copies, two of which are cracked right across the center and are unplayable. One has edge warp. Somebody tried to play it, so the needle cut the grooves right out. The other one has edge warp, and so only the center portion is playable. We don't know if this was recorded directly onto a diamond disc or was recorded from a telephone uh, diaphragm onto a diamond disc. It's interesting also in that it shows a certain declamatory style of speaking that was popular in 1915. The recording was backed by a recording of Anna Case. You'll hear Anna Case in selection number 17. We did not uh, play the recording of the Anna Case that was on the back of this because uh, the Pearl of Brazil that the site owns is not the Pearl of Brazil that was on the back. The copy that the site owns is a take, is a later take and so we did not want to distort our history. The one that we will play later, the Sonambula, is also a relatively early Edison and is contemporaneous with this, but more about that later. An Edison granular carbon telephone transmitter is transforming the sound waves into electrical impulses, which, after following the tortuous paths of copper beneath rivers and bays, over valleys, Deserts, plains, and mountains are being reproduced in San Francisco as articulate speech. The flood of mellow light which illuminates this historic room emanates from Edison incandescent lamps, and to indulge an appropriate and pleasing sentiment, the electricity for these lamps is being furnished tonight by the Laboratory Emergency Reserve Edison Storage Battery. By the invention of your friend, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, speech may now be transmitted all over the world. And through the intermediary of your invention, the diamond disc phonograph, permanent records are being made of the voices of great statesmen, wonderful human songbirds, and the renditions of famous musicians, all of which will be transmitted down the ages to future generations of men and women whose great-grandsires have not as yet 
been born. While you have been accomplishing many and great things in the comprehensive field of your activities, the personnel of the wonderful organization under Mr. Theodore N. Vail, head of the Bell System, and his illustrious chief engineer, Mr. Carty, have spent years of effort and millions of capital to reach the goal they have so recently accomplished. On January 25th, 1915, they astonished the entire world by the establishment of true and excellent telephone service between Pacific Pacific Pacific. It's all we could get of the record. As I say, the edge warp just lifted the reproducer from the record. We just couldn't do more than that. The next recording, we are reproducing a little bit of our last program because what good is a program with a complete electronic approach to things? So you might as well hear what an Edison diamond disc phonograph sounded like. Uh, it has another feature with it, and that is, if you remember our last program, dealt with the Edison tone test. And this was a tone test recording, which was used in theaters uh, to show the fact that the Edison recording system was a superior one. Uh, we're really sneaky about this because this is the Dan Trio. And it gave us an excuse, of course, as soon as the selection is over, to introduce you to one of the artists who is on the record. So here is the Dan Trio in a tone test selection uh, recorded, uh, well, I don't have my notes in front of me, so you'll have to see.
would like to introduce you to Rosalind Davis Kaplan. It's good to be here again. And I want to say thank you to the following people. Mrs. Leah Burt, the Malbridge from Buffalo, New York, and the forever young couple, the Pushkins from Houston, Texas. Perhaps you wonder, after all these years, how I happen to be here. Well, it's due to the private detective work of Mr. Merritt Malvern at the controls. Friends called me and said, have you seen the paper tonight? I come from Worcester, Massachusetts. And they said, your name is in the personal column. Oh, I said, you must be kidding. I always thought the personal column was for those who agreed to disagree. <laughs> but I was sent this clipping, help, phonograph researcher requesting information on Worcester musicians, Blanche Dan, Felice Dan, and Rosalind Davis. Please write Malvern, Grimsby Road, Buffalo, New York. There was a slight discussion with my husband and he said, I don't think I'd write to him. <laughs> you don't know. I said, no, I'll take a chance. And the chance is how I happen to be here tonight. I was looking through my scrapbook and I found a very interesting clipping. We were playing a summer engagement at Manchester, Vermont. Have any of you ever been there? Yes. Oh, it's a beautiful place. Interlocking elm trees on the main street and marble slabs for sidewalks. It's typically New England and beautiful. Manchester is the county seat and at the time we were there, there was a murder trial going on, and there were reporters from New York, Boston, and all the different cities. In the course of conversation, one of the reporters said to us, what do you girls do in the winter? And we said we hoped to be doing concert work and tone test work for the Edison Company. And he said, wait, and I'll have the photographer come. I said, well, there was a clause in my contract that was a little bit difficult. My good husband is sitting there. And the clause was, we could not marry for two years. Well, I adhered strictly to that. Well, this friend called me and said, I am sending you a clipping. And there was the picture of the trio with the write-up that we couldn't marry for two years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Two uh, words about the Sonambula recording of Anna Case. Anna Case was one of Edison's favorite artists, as you can tell by any of the old catalogs. And she recorded quite well for a soprano. The recording is quite full. Despite that fact, it did stay in the catalog, which is unusual. You will notice also the fact that the harp Re was a very difficult in instrument to record. It's on here and also recorded quite well.
But you can see they could pack quite a bit on an old recording. Uh, interestingly enough, with this recording, it is my belief the fact that this was issued delayed the Edison Company from releasing the Bory recording of the same selection, which they finally did release when they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and looking through old recordings in the mid-1920s just to keep the catalog going. Uh, the next recording shows a... Yes? Uh, may I take a moment to, to, to say something? My name's Fred Williams. I uh, called Anna Case Mackey today, had a very brief conversation with her. I'm sorry to say that conditions are not such that she's able to um, be here, and I don't know that she will be in the future. I have spoken to Lee Bird about it, and I think she'll make some arrangements, hopefully, that we might have somebody visit her. Good. I'd love to have it happen. Thank you, Fred. Fred is our military band expert, and Fred is one of the reasons that we put this next recording on. Uh, we wanted to show a, an example of a band recording because the Edison Company was quite successful with it. This uh, uh, is not to take any credit away from Victor, but the Edison Company did quite a wonderful job with it. Fred is also involved with the Victor Matrix project, but that's a long story. This particular one, I think, if anything, was too successful. In fact, it was so successful, they didn't issue it.
as you see, I think the thing was much too forward and probably did not pass wear tests, and so it was not issued. 